We are on step four. Continue to take, um, we've made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and the scripture tied into that. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalms 139. Hold your finger there. I'm going to share something with you. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I believe it's, uh, yeah. I'm, on, I'm going to be going into another scripture too tonight. How's everybody doing tonight, all right? It's good to start off on Monday. I know. Right? Especially now. Crazy, yeah. Mm -hmm. The weather was nuts today. Oh. Yeah. Just imagine, it should have been snow. Because it's, it's cold. It should have been cold. cold. Yeah, there would have been a blizzard. Yeah. There would have been, yeah. been a vicious I blizzard. thank Jesus. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Jesus. Right. 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 That it was rain. We would have had a bad blizzard. Yeah. yeah it would have been, been a start to a real tough winter. Yeah. It's only a few more days from the beginning of winter. The 21st is the beginning of winter. But it's definitely getting cold enough to snow. So thank God it did it. Yeah, yeah. I like the snow on Christmas Eve, just a little bit yeah. of flakes coming yeah. down, covering White the Christmas. trees, mm -hmm. a little bit underground, and that's good. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> that's good <laughs> enough. <laughs> all right, hold your finger there. I want to share something with you. All right, in step four. At the root of all addiction is our sin nature, okay? And specific, specifically our selfishness. We want to be on the throne. We want to control the direction of our lives and quite often the lives of those around us. If they would only do as I tell them, if they would only listen to my advice, if they would only use their heads, our resentments and insecurities grow as we find ourselves unable to have that complete control. If you look at the origin of our problem relationships and difficulties, we almost always find that the root is a decision we have made based on selfish motives. That decision and, it, and its resulting action cause us to offend, to harm, or betray others and to invite retaliation. If we are to live in freedom, we must face the fact of our human sin nature and take continual action to correct such behaviors and any wrongs we have committed. So one thing we have to understand, everybody thinks that this program's based on drugs and alcohol, which is outward things. It's really based on behaviors. Amen. It's our behaviors that cause the problems, and everybody has them behaviors. I mean, drugs and alcohol is just a cover. Some people cover them with other things, shopping, shopping. food, you name it. Gambling, sex, you, you, you name it. But we're all covering something, our selfishness inside. The basic forms of selfishness in, of, in all of us are resentments, fear, pride, envy, dishonesty, greed, and, mor or, and moral or sexual misconduct or lust. All these will block God's spirit and make it hard for us to know His will or feel His presence. As these blocks are identified, we can be freed from the burden of trying to look good. The goal is to become more real and honest with people who are in relationship with us. To be searching and fearless, we must look at ourselves morally, because God is just and moral. This is difficult when we have been consumed by addiction and mired in self-will. Fear must be put aside, and humility will grow a little as we are willing to document our flaws and misbehaviors. Mm. We examine the people, institutions, situations, and events of our lives that have caused us pain and resentment, and we assess our part in them. We do not excuse others of their wrongs, but we see our side on the street. For the first time, we take responsibility for how we have been resentful and fearful, judgmental and critical, negative and isolating. Usually, these responses originate from perceived or real threats to our self-esteem, pride, ambition, material or emotional security, and relationships both acceptable and hidden. 
No, the good news, the good news about this work is that we gain an honest picture of ourselves, possibly for the first time. Because you know it as well as I do. All of us think, I'm not that bad. I'm not bad as those people or them. I'm pretty much a good person. Compared to who? Compared to others, yeah, you might be. But compared to Jesus, we all are what? In the same boat. Okay? We have to, we compare ourselves to Jesus, all of us are, are, are off. If we weren't so miserable and desperate for a new life, we wouldn't be this gut level honest. We begin to see patterns of behavior that have caused us trouble time and time again. If fear is a huge pattern for us, we must turn this over to God. If resentment is our reaction to being hurt or snubbed, we must learn to pray for the person that hurts us. Any resentment, whether justified or unjustified, allows that person to control us. Even if he or she has forgotten the incident, obviously there is less room for God in our lives if we are controlled by resentment and fears. Letting go of resentments and fears by working the first three steps on them will banish our irritable, discontented attitudes. Mm -hmm. Serenity and peace of mind can flow into our lives. Internal changes will become more apparent to others. After a thorough searching and fearless inventory, we can gain a clear understanding of how basing our lives on self has kept us from freely walking close to God. It becomes clear that we have and an anesthesia the emotion I think I said that wrong. Yeah. How do you say anesthesia? Anesthesia? No, it's ana anesthesia. <laughs> the emotion. Anesthetized. Maybe. Well you're gonna get you're gonna go yeah. on an anesthesia, all right? So we anesthesia the so we anesthesia the emotional and mental pain of our lives, or we block them with our addictive substances and behaviors further cutting us off from God. This first inventory is the beginning of a lifelong practice of self-examination that leads us out of addiction and into a relationship with God. And that's so true. I don't know how many times I've done this process and there's still layers and mm -hmm. layers and layers of junk underneath there. That I keep doing step four all the time. There's, there's definitely stuff in there. So we can't just think, think we can do this once and we're healed. We never, we're never done with this. And as a matter of fact, we gain new, we, we gain new bad attitudes as we're walking with the Lord. It's just, yeah. it, it's crazy. We become crazy. We get crazy. Sometimes our pride kicks in. Sometimes our self will kicks in. Sometimes our works kick in. We think we got to work and perform, yes. and we and we get so many character defects. It's not even funny. Yes. So we have to understand. We have to what? do a fearless moral inventory. You know why? Because God already knows us all already. Right. Look at Psalm 139. Look what he says. King David sing, um, talking to the Lord here. He's actually singing. Psalms is actually singing. They're actually singing. I know. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It says in, in verse 1, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even if even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully.
complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Imagine, so the Lord knew you before you were even born. He knew you before the world started. He knew everything about you, and he does know everything about you now. So that's why step four is so good to do, and just admit to God all your flaws, because he knows them already. You can't hide from him. That's why everybody does, when everybody wants to do something wrong, they wait till it gets dark, right? When you go clubbing and partying, you wait till 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, because you think nobody can see you. <coughs> God can see you at night, so you can't get away from him. You might be able to hide from people, but never from God. Look at what it says. Every day of my life, you're 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They unnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. O oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. O oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. And here it is in verse 23. Mm -hmm. Here's step four right here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So when we go into this step four, we always invite God into it. When you invite God into it, He will show you what's wrong with you. He'll show you all your character defects and all your flaws, and then what? You write them down. Because He sees what you can't see. And when you invite God into it, things are going to surface and act defects of character that we didn't think was so defective. But when you compare yourself to the Word of God, a lot of the stuff we did was defective and sinful. And we thought that it wasn't. We, 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 we were like, we, we labeled sin in a certain way, but God, sin across the board is sin across the board. Jesus said, even if you get mad at somebody, it's like you murdered them. Mm -hmm. So, does that belong on our inventory? Yes. Resentment is, is, is like murder, the Bible says. How many of us have resented people, got angry with people, criticized people, character assassinated people, gossiped about people, then you want to put it down on paper and say, yeah, that's me, that's what I do. How can anybody say that they haven't done that? Can I get a big amen? Yeah. And we're going to go to now, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's on page 1488. 1488. Yeah, 1488. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. See it, constructive sorrow? Yeah, yeah. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We have we all have to deal with sorrow. We may try to stuff it down and ignore it. We may try to drown it by giving into our addiction or avoid feeling it by intellectualizing. But sorrow doesn't go away. We need to accept the sorrow that will be a part of the inventory process. Not all sorrow is bad for us. The Apostle Paul had written a letter to the church in Corinth that made them very sad because Paul confronted them about something they were doing wrong. At first, he was sorry they had hurt them, 
But later he said, now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience <clears throat> leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. To see what this godly sorrow produced in you. You showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. 2 Corinthians 7, 9-11. to Jeremiah said, Though God brings grief, He also shows compassion because of the greatness of His unfailing love. For He does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. Lamentations 3, 32-33. The Corinthians' grief was good. It came from honest self-evaluation not morbid self-condemnation. We can learn to accept our sorrow as a positive part of recovery, not as punishment. I'm going to name that there. Mm-hmm. All right, let's read chapter 7. Now explain a little bit about this. Doing this with God and doing this without God is two different things. There's doing it the world system way and there's doing it God's way. And the Bible shows us what the difference is going to be. We're going to go in chapter 7. We're going to read it from verse 1. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Please open your hearts to us. We have not done wrong to anyone, nor let anyone astray, nor taken advantage of anyone. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I said before that you are in our hearts and we live or die together with you. I have the highest confidence in you and I take great pride in you. You have greatly encouraged me and made me happy despite all our troubles. Paul's joy at the church's repentance. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. But God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. When he told us how much you longed to see me and how sorry you are for what happened and how loyal you are to me, I was filled with joy. Now, I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. Now, before I go on, God causes pain in our life so we can get better, not bitter. It causes us to what? Repent and change our ways. So if you get better, you repent, you turn from it, and you change your ways. If you get bitter, you get mad at God and stay in it. Two things happen here. You can get better or get bitter. But it, God causes pain for us to repent and change our ways. Now look, look what it says. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. What's he talking about? Worldly sorrow doesn't... All right, I'm sorry. You tell somebody I'm sorry, but you do it again. You don't change. I'm sorry. You do it again. You don't change. What that does is it kills you spiritually. It's saying, that's like saying, all right, I'm sorry I went to work late. Instead of changing that, I'm going to keep going into work late and say I'm sorry. There's no repentance there. It's worldly sorrow. There's no repentance. There's no change involved. God wants us, when he causes pain in our lives, for us to change and not do it anymore. That's what he's trying to say here. Worldly sorrow, which is robotic, it doesn't make you change. It's just say, oh, I'm sorry. Then tomorrow or the next day you do it again. Mm. And there's no change. 
Godly sorrow causes us to what? Repent, go before the Lord, and change our ways. Pain is the motivator for us to change. That's why he has to cause pain in our life. We don't change when we get blessed. We get changed when we get broken. But if you handle it the wrong way, you won't change. Now listen. Look what it did for the Corinthians. To see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, to, such concern to clear yourself. Such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish wrong. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. My purpose then was not to write about who did the wrong or who was wrong. I wrote to you so that the sight, in the sight of God you can see for yourself how loyal we are, you are to us. We have been greatly encouraged by this. In addition to our encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was about the way all of you welcomed him and set his mind at, set his mind at ease. I told him how proud he was of you and you didn't disappoint me. I have always told you the truth, and now my boasting to Titus has also proved true. Now he cares for you more than ever when he remembers the way all of you obeyed him and welcomed him with such fear and deep respect. I am very happy now because I have complete confidence in you. What's he trying to say here? In other words, he, he, Paul was worried when, he went, when Titus went there that they were going to get bitter because of that letter. Mm -hmm. right? He thought, oh no. What am, I, what am I going to do? Are they going to turn and walk away from me? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to come and welcome Titus and want Paul back, you know, and love him because of the severe letter that he sent them? But Paul was encouraged because they repented and changed their ways, and they understood that the pain was caused them, you know, to get closer to God. Mm -hmm. So, as Christians, we have to understand when we're in pain, God's trying to show us something, and he's trying to what, make changes in our lives. And the step work helps us get there. See? Because they wanted to clear themselves. See what it says? You did, not, did everything necessary to make things right. So what we do in the step work, we write down our defects. We admit to God to another human being. We ask God to get rid of them. In step eight, we make a list of all persons we harm. We try to make things right with everybody. We make things right with God. We make things right with ourselves. And we make things right with others. That's what, it's, that's what the whole thing's about. This whole process is about becoming whole again. See, we can't become complete or whole unless all three of them things are accomplished. We have to get right with God first. We have to get right with ourselves. And then we have to what? Get right with others. And then we are complete. And that's where the peace comes in. Now we're good in all areas of our lives. Can I get an amen here? All right. Look at the, the, the writing in the bottom, verse 7. On the bottom, see 7, 11 to 13 here? Mm -hmm. On the bottom of page 1488. I want to read this. When we admit our sins to God and others and do what we can to follow God's will, wonderful changes take place in our life. In these verses, we see that such repentance produces fruit on three fronts. It purifies and revitalizes our life and emotions in a remarkable way. Two, it renews our relationship with God. And three, it has amazing effect for good on our relationships with other people. What I just said. Mm -hmm. Both those we have wronged and onlookers who are encouraged by the refreshing changes that have been taking place. And look at the bottom, the other one. For all the mistakes the Corinthians made in their relationship with Paul, they did do one thing right. They listened when Titus presented Paul's version of some early events that they had misinterpreted. This teachability and lack of defensiveness drew great admiration and love from both Titus and Paul. A willingness to listen and be teachable is necessary for a successful recovery. See it? A willingness to listen and be, be teachable is necessary for a successful recovery. It will help us take an honest moral inventory and follow God's good plan for our lives. So we always have to remain what? Humble and teachable. None of us arrive, but always learning something new about God, about ourselves, and about others. All right? Well, thank you for letting me share in that. We're going to answer some questions now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.